Hey, it's Mike. Uh, I wanted to uh, look back on the year and say thank you for all the downloads of the podcast. It's been amazing. We've grown month over month. And, you know, as I reflect on the year, I feel that I'm very fortunate to have this podcast and I have all of you uh, listening, which is awesome. And what I wanted to do uh, was to put together and, you know, re-release the best of what I think are the best episodes of the year. There's many more, but these are these are some that I wanted to release during the holiday period for your convenience. And I wanted to wish you and your families a, uh, a great holiday season and a healthy and prosperous new year as we go onward on our journey. So enjoy. It's Mike at Craft Beer Storm, also founder brewer at Bear Brewing Company in glorious Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We have a, a special guest. We have Mitch Steele. He used to be the brewmaster at Stone Brewing, right? They did some amazing stuff. They're still doing amazing stuff, but now he's moved on. He, he's at New Realm Brewing, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, they also have another location in Virginia, Virginia Beach. Uh, making some awesome stuff. And uh, yeah, I wanted to get him on the podcast. I appreciate his time. Uh, we had a great conversation. So, um, But first, if do me a favor, please go on to iTunes. Uh, give us a rating and review. Uh, you know, tell a, ten, a friend, tell 10 friends. And, down, you know, subscribe to our podcast. That's the only way we get the word out. Uh, we get up in the rankings. People notice us. And it just fuels everything. Uh, but that, but the only way we can do it is if you help me out and, and do this. Uh, downloads are going up, which is cool. But we need more, more of an effort. Um, I, I give you this stuff for free. I, do, I don't charge you anything. I don't sell you anything. I just want to bring you great quality content. Um, and we're doing that. And, um, you know, you're responding by the uh, downloads going up, which I appreciate. And I thank you. Uh, but we, we're to get to a place where we need to be, we got to have a lot more, more, uh, a lot more activity and uh, you know likes and uh, just I would appreciate it. All right. Anyway, I'm going to stop now. But we're going to talk to Mitch. Here we go. Hey, we're here with uh, Mitch Steele. How you doing, Mitch? I'm good. Thanks. How are you? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm doing okay. I appreciate you uh, carving out the time. Uh, to talk to me today. Um, today's been nuts, man. I, I it's like All Star Day. I had I had the uh, brewmaster for Guinness before. Oh, nice. <laughs> it was uh, Fergal. He used to be the um, the brewmaster there at uh, at Guinness. Uh, but now, well, he says he's still the you know he never retires or, but he he uh, you know he he was there. And then we have uh, we had uh, Jason from uh, Allagash. I just oh, got, cool! I just yeah. got off the phone with him, and now I have you. So I have like all star, all star Thursday, Thursday Thunder. That's what I call it. Cool. So hey, so I appreciate it, and maybe we can start off um, like your story, how you got started, you know, where you are now, and and your journey. Maybe you can go into that. Yeah. Well, um, I guess I'll, I'll start off. I've been I've been brewing professionally for over thirty years. Um, if you'd lump in the, the home brewing that I did before I started brewing professionally, it's been about, uh, 35, 36 years. Um, and, uh, I, I went to school at the university of California at Davis, which has a really great and world renowned winemaking program, but they also had a brewing program there that I didn't know about until after I got there. And so I was taking some winemaking classes and I found out about the brewing classes and just gravitated over to that. And uh, graduated in 1984 with a fermentation science degree, uh, which covered winemaking and brewing, which was cool. Um, did winemaking for a bit after I got out of school and then uh, got on with a startup craft uh, pub brewery in California, just south of the Bay Area called San Andreas. And I spent four years there uh, when we were brewing kind of kind of uh, lower alcohol, sessionable English style ales. Uh, English style being kind of what everybody was doing back then when they were opening up brew pubs. But uh, San Andreas um, sounds scary, right? Maybe it's on the fault there. 
<laughs> yeah, well, the, the town we were in was Hollister, and it, it, Hollister's nickname is the earthquake capital of the oh my world. God. <laughs> two of the two of the biggest faults in California right run right through the center. Did of anything town, happen so. while you were there? I mean, any earthquake? Oh yeah, or? yeah. Well, the the big Loma Prieta quake in '89 happened there, and it shut the, the town down for about a week and did a lot of damage. So, you oh, know, I've man. been through some pretty nasty earthquakes. Uh, they're not fun. <laughs> no, but anyway, <laughs> I spent four years there, and then uh, uh, decided I really, and, and it was never going to be, I don't think, a career for me at, at, at this place. It just, you know, we weren't making enough beer for that. But uh, I, I ended up moving on to Anheuser Busch and um, in 1992, and moved to Colorado, and was a shift supervisor at their big brewery in Fort Collins, and. Um, you know, enjoyed that job. I, my goal, you know, when I joined Anheuser-Busch was just to learn how to, how to run a brewery and how to manage a brewing process. I, cause they are the best in the world at, at, at managing brewing processes and making sure the beer tastes the same every single right. batch. The quality control. It, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I learned a heck of a lot about that. I, I, I told myself I'd, you know, I'd do it for five years minimum and learn as much as I could and then maybe get back out into craft, which is what I really wanted to do. And I ended okay. up staying at AB for 14 years. Uh, oh, wow. I had a really good career there. I did new product development for a few years. And uh, my last few years at Anheuser-Busch, I, I was in New Hampshire working at the Merrimack. Right. Brewery, um, and enjoyed that a lot and uh, might not have left if they had told me I could have stayed in New Hampshire for the rest of my life, but that wasn't going to happen. They were going to move me. Move so you around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in 2006, I, uh, I took a job with stone. Um, at the time it was a head brewer position and over a few years I was there as I took on more responsibilities, it became a brewmaster position. And I, I spent 10 years at stone. So, uh, uh, just a, a wonderful experience. Yeah. Um, got to do so many cool things at stone and, oh, yeah. and then, um, uh, and then these guys approached me, uh, about doing new realm in 2016. And, uh, I made the very tough decision to leave stone and, and join up with these guys, and right. and I've been doing this ever since. But now your your time at Stone was really epic. I guess you came up. You had the enjoy enjoy by IPA, right? I mean, that, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I still every time it comes out, I'm like, oh, when is it? And like enjoy by Christmas, enjoy by April, fifteenth. Yeah, or, yeah. Those were fun. I mean, you know, Greg Greg threw the concept out, and I was like, oh my gosh, that is crazy, but it's brilliant. You know, the idea of having a beer with a 35 day shelf life. But, you know, we were trying to make a point and uh, and he pretty much let me do whatever I wanted to do with the formulation of the beer. I, you know, I just I was in the middle of writing my book on India Pale Ale at the time. Right. And I had this 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 big document that had all these tips from all the a lot of brewers that I really, really respect about how they brewed double IPAs. And I said, Greg, let, I, what I'd like to do is take the best I see here on this sheet and incorporate all of it into, into this beer. And he's like, as long as the beer tastes great, I don't care what you do. <laughs> ah, right. He's just letting you go. Right. Yeah. And now yeah, your book, so he, just, he to, just, let me go. just to let everybody know, it's called IPA brewing techniques for recipes and the evolution of the India pale ale, which is just the IPA style. It's just, it won't go away. It's just getting <laughs> more and more people. I think the pro the thing is like people are coming off these watery beers and they're discovering these IPAs like more and more. So the style just like just stays around. Yeah. You know, and it's become a real buzzword now so that when people come in, they just say, I want to try your IPA and they don't really know what it, what that means. Right. Um, uh, I mean, you know, most beer drinkers do, but there are a lot of beer drinkers that I see that just, yeah. Oh man, I should be drinking this craft beer, this IPA, you know, and, and right. without, and, and I think what's helped with that is, is the uh, the development of the New England IPA, which isn't as bitter as what I was brewing at Stone, you know. So you, fruity, you've got yeah. a beer that's yeah, it's it's very fruit forward and it's it's softer on the palate and it's not quite as abrasive, um, and so it's not quite the acquired taste that a West Coast IPA was, you know, where yeah. where people might not like them the first few times they tried them and then and then kind of grew to like them. I think with the with the hazy IPAs, the New England IPAs, I think it's a it's it's a little bit more accessible, you know, which is which is a good thing for for brewers. Yeah. So right, and it's become uh, yeah these big milkshakes. They call them milkshakes now. They're very cloudy and uh, yeah the New England IPAs. But yeah, yeah, your your beers were um, at Stone. They were bitter, but they had this explosive hop 
you know, character to them as well. I mean, you put, you, yeah. you must have lo- loaded them up, I guess, with hops and like, what was the ratio? I guess it's like you know, on a pounds per barrel basis on yeah. some of the beers. Yeah. I, you know, most of the beers it's, it's stone. Um, <clears throat> I think we're in between two and three pounds per barrel kind of on average. Mm-hmm. Uh, the dry hopping was, you know, when I got to stone, it was, you know, three quarters of a pound to a pound and a half per barrel. And, and some of the beers, two pounds per barrel. Um, and we didn't start venturing into what a lot of people are doing now with the five and six pounds per barrel until Man. we got to things like enjoy by, um, enjoy by is, has a lot of hops in it. And, um, you know, and every, you know, and this is something that as, as these IPAs developed over time, this is something I saw a lot of people doing. And I remember talking to Julian Schrago at, at Beachwood, uh, brewing and barbecue in, in Long Beach. And I think he's an amazing brewer and brews some of the best IPAs I've ever had. And he, he told me flat out, he said he won't even consider dry hopping anything at less than two pounds per barrel, which, you know, back when I first started dry hopping beers, a quarter pound per barrel, half pound per barrel was the going rate. And now it's, now it's huge. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's the whole thing. I mean, a lot, a lot of the late additions in the, uh, in the boil, yeah, um, we do that here. I mean, I don't. I used to do it in the beginning. They were kind of bitter, but now everybody wants you know, like late, like five minutes left or ten minutes left. Just throw everything in. <laughs> also, dry exactly. hopping. Yeah, we do a double IPA too, and I have to dry hop it next week with some. Uh, we use the the, the Falconer's Flight. Uh, oh yeah, seas. It's awesome, awesome stuff. You know, for the yeah. double IPA we make. Um, nice. And also the the Australian uh, hops are awesome as well. Uh, that are coming out really fantastic but yeah. um so that was interesting and i saw that you grew uh you grew the the brewery from like forty nine thousand barrels to like three hundred and twenty five thousand barrels like in 2000 yeah something like that we we increased about tenfold while i was in the 10 years i was there and wow. it, you know it, it was stone it was it was always a construction zone we were always working on expansion projects uh, some were bigger than others. Some it was just bringing in more fermenters, but some it was, you know, building a, you know, we built a, when I got there, we had a 50,000 square foot space for brewing and packaging and warehousing. And by the time I left, we had moved all the warehousing to its own space, which was, I think, 100,000 square feet. Uh, and then we had built another 50,000 square foot building where we put all the packaging and bright tank operations. So we had two 50,000 square foot buildings that were dedicated 100% to brewing and packaging. Uh, it was, it was crazy times for sure. I mean, we were just growing like, like bonkers. Yeah. The beer was very good and it's all over the place. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's excellent. Really excellent. Um, yeah. And, and I guess mostly focused on IPA. Did you do anything else than other than IPAs there? I think you had maybe some darker beer or you did the arrogant bastard. Was that? Oh, sure. Yeah. We, we did a lot of different beers. The one thing, that Greg really wasn't interested in was doing classic styles unless they were really boldly flavored. So, you know, some of the lower alcohol sessionable type beers, he, he didn't have a lot of interest in, in doing that, but we did focus on IPAs, but we also did a, a number of Belgian beers. Um, we did a series called vertical Epic where we came out with a new Belgian, uh, recipe every year. Um, we, uh, you know, we did uh, a number of imperial stouts. We did a series of beers that we brewed with home brewers that, you know, we picked the recipe during a contest and uh, was part of the Brewers Association, uh, um, uh, uh, the homebrew, um, the homebrewers part of the Brewers Association. We were okay. doing membership rallies for them and we had a contest every year that the winning, winning homebrew we picked and would brew that beer on our system. And so there was a lot of different things that we did there. But, uh, you know, I think the one thing that characterized all of our beers uh, at Stone and probably still does at Stone because they're still kind of carrying on with with this for sure. But, you know, just really boldly flavored, aggressively flavored beers. And it doesn't mean harsh or undrinkable, but just beers that are packed with flavor. And that was that was something that was always part of what Stone tried to do. Right. And they succeeded, you know. Uh, big time, you know. I mean, I always want to get a stone beer. And when I was on tap, I just order a stone beer. You know, you, you don't. <laughs> we don't have your. Uh, oh, I used to do it, but New Realm is not really. You're not really widely distributed, right? You're in, no, uh, no, we're not. We're when we started this company out, we didn't have any aspirations to try and become a 
uh, even a, a national brewer or even a, a large regional brewer, we wanted to stick our beers, uh, have them stick pretty close to home and really, really be kind of focus on our local audience. And so right now, um, you know, we have two breweries. We, we have the original brewery in Atlanta and we distribute beer um, throughout the state of Georgia. But I'd say a, a huge percentage of, of the beer that we send to distribution is is. Uh, makes its way to Atlanta Metro and and is in the Atlanta Metro region. Um, we send bits and pieces down to Southern Georgia to Savannah and 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 some other spots, uh, Athens and things like that. But I think most, uh, almost all of our beer stays pretty close to the Atlanta Metro area. Right, and you, and and New Realm was interesting. Like you left, I guess a, a group of. Uh, uh, individuals approached you i guess at stone and said hey we want to start a brewery and are you still living in yeah. california still or where yeah yeah for a few more months i uh, oh. uh my daughter is a senior in high school in california oh. and part of the deal when i took this job was that i wasn't going to move until after she graduated high school so right. um so i've been commuting uh from california to atlanta or virginia beach uh just about every week this year Wow. Um, you know, it didn't start off. It started off kind of like an every other week thing, which was pretty easy compared to what it is now. But, um, you know, I've, I've got till June and then um, and then we'll pick up and move east. Well, you started, I guess, the New Realm started a couple of years ago or last year or was it two years? So ago? we opened yeah. we opened in January of 2018. Oh, OK, uh, right. we started brewing in November of 2017. Right. The, the company was founded several years ago. I joined in 2016. Uh, in July, and that's when we found our location for our Atlanta brewery was was that month, um, and it took us a year and a half to get that up and running. Yeah, it's very interesting. Oh, it's across the country. Well, wow. you had to go all the way across. But I mean, uh, the Virginia Beach location is interesting. I think was that the one that Green Flash was going to open, and then you guys went yep. into it, or it is, it is. Wow. That's yeah, unfortunate what happened with Green Flash, but uh, apparently they're coming out again. They're, I think they're resurrecting it and really excellent. Yeah, beer. Green Flash never went away. They just uh, they they put that location up for auction. Yeah, uh, and then they they pulled back their operations to focus on the West Coast, where where they've got a big brewery out there. And they never really stopped operating. They just yeah. had a change of ownership and just such. Kind of but, re- yeah, uh, yeah, kind of retrenched and rebooted, but. Um, yeah, I mean, we were able to get that. Brew. It's a beautiful brew house. It's a fifty thousand square foot brewing area. Wow, I uh, see the pictures probably, online. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's gorgeous, you know. And and to be able to get, we were we were just starting to talk about building a production facility because the Atlanta brewery, we have limited space here to grow, and um, and uh, you know, so. Um, you know, we were starting to think that, hey, you know, if, if we keep growing the way we are, we're going to have to build a production brewery. And we didn't want to, you know, we knew that was going to be a year and a half to two years to get that going. So oh, yeah. um, we were starting to talk about it pretty early. And and then this thing came up and uh, we found out about it. And our owners uh, um, said, yeah, we're going to be um, this is a good investment. This is going to. Oh, yeah take care of us for a long time and let's just, let's do it. It looks really so, nice. Yeah. And then I see that. What, nice. what is your uh, brew house in Atlanta? What size is that? So the Atlanta brew house is a Steinecker 25 hectoliter uh, micro cube. So, or combi cube or whatever they call it, but it's uh <laughs> it's a 25 hectoliter, uh, basically uh, 20 barrels. And, 20 barrel um, system. Okay. Yeah. 20 barrel system. And, um, um, yeah, and uh, we've got 16 40 barrel fermenters and four 60 barrel fermenters here, uh, so we can wow. probably, if we if we were humming along, we could probably do 10 to 15 thousand barrels a year here. Wow. Um, and then the Virginia Beach facility, that's a 50 barrel Mueller brew house, and that oh, so it's a German? No, it's American. Mueller, Mueller. Oh, out of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, and we can do 40,000 barrels there right now, but there's room for a lot more fermenters and we could probably get up close to a hundred thousand barrels over time if, if we needed to. So I see the fermenters, the picture is like a massive fermenters. 
Yeah, they're 200, 10, 250 barrel fermenters, which we hardly ever <laughs> use. That we're not brewing enough of any beer to, to really use those. But we've got some hundred barrel fermenters and some fifty barrel fermenters in there as well. So, so you can do some big time, uh, di I guess, distribution. Do you use any distributors now, or how does that work? Or do you self? -distribute? Yeah, we have. Um, we can't self distribute um, in Georgia, and I'm not sure what the law is in Virginia, but we went. We've got, uh, we're distributing now in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia, which is Norfolk and Virginia Beach and uh, some of the towns around there, and then also the Williamsburg area. So just in that one corner of Virginia. Um, and, you know, we'll see, we'll see how that goes for a while before we look at expanding into the rest of the state. But, um, you know, it's just, a, let's take it slow. Let's build the business and make sure, you know, that, that there's, uh, you know, the infrastructure's there to support growth. Absolutely. A lot of brew. And I keep talking about that. Well, we do brew news on Friday. You know, I do like three podcasts a week, different things. Uh, so brew, mm -hmm. brewers on Monday, then we do beer styles. Like I take the GAB, uh, BF list and I go through a different style of Wednesday. Oh, and then cool. Fridays I do, uh, news and it's just like a soap opera. It's a drama. All these guys just go nuts. They take all this cash and they'll, they'll, they'll just buy a 30 barrel system and start brewing beer. And they don't know if they're going to sell it or not. And then they end up having beer and then they get arguments with distributors and then they can't make their payments and then the bank comes in and takes them over. That's pretty yeah. much what happens. That's the story I see over and over again. So I think slow and methodical, make sure you have the uh, footprint and you know build the beers that, that sell. Uh, which your beers are, are great anyway. They're probably, I, I just looking at descriptions of them. Uh, the hazy, like a Fox is interesting. And then you have other yeah. IPAs, uh, that are really interesting as well. So, yeah. We're um, trying to do a big cross section of beers, you know, and one of the things that we've learned is that the beers that do well in our restaurants aren't necessarily the ones that are going to get a lot of interest out in distribution. So, uh -huh. you know, we've kind of had to separate our focuses a little bit. For, for example, our, our best selling beer or one of our best selling beers in our restaurant is a 5% Belgian, like a single. And, okay. you know, it was one of the first beers that we brewed and it just has been the most popular beer in Atlanta and in our restaurant in Atlanta since we released it. Um, in mm. Virginia Beach, the most popular beer there is a Munich Dunkel. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know, we, we see it every month. You know, it's selling. It's in the top three. And, you never know until you uh, make these things and then see what sells. It's unbelievable. It's, it's kind of cool, you know. And, and certainly a Munich Dunkel is not a beer you can go out and put in package and distribute and expect Dunkel. to have huge sales of. <laughs> but the fact that people people like it when they come into our place is, is really nice. It's really cool. Um yeah, but we're doing, you know, we're doing several different types of IPAs. And I'm, you know, despite the fact that we're doing a lot of other things, I still love brewing IPAs. And, you know, we're brewing, you know, we've got uh, Hoplandia, which is kind of a West Coast influenced IPA. And we've got um, Hoptropolis, which is a little bit more tropical and a little bit less bitter and, you know, kind yeah. of more in lines with what people in this area uh, prefer. And, uh, you know, and then we've got the, the, you know, the New England type IPA, um, you know, that we just we started brewing um, spring of last year and uh, have been having some fun with that and learning about how to brew those styles and how to, you know, how to keep the haze in the beer, which is to me a huge challenge. I uh, I always get a kick out of all these brewers that say New England IPAs are you know lazy brewing, and I'm like, no, it's not. No, even it's close. hard to it's... keep the head. What do you do? Tell me. Can you release that secret? Uh, I, we haven't really succeeded. <laughs> yet. Oh, we can I talk mean, we're offline. Just, yeah, we're doing, I've been trying. Know, I mean, we're I... doing the you know we're doing flake oats and malted oats. Yeah. And trying. I do wheat, the same thing too. Yeah, the flake, you know, the oatmeal. I'm like doing everything. You know, flake. We everything. haven't we haven't tried flour or anything yet. You know, oh I my kind god, of, I'm kind of not Who wanting to do that. Uh, Todd Ma told me uh, lactose. People are using lactose in it. Yeah, we we use lactose in ours as well, milk sugar, <laughs> just to keep the gra you know the keep With it the kind gravity. of full bodied and and, yeah. and keep the terminal gravity up a bit. But yeah, it's um you know it's just one of those things where it's it's. You know, on the surface, people think it's it's just kind of taking shortcuts. And, and as I've learned about this style, it's like, no, there's a lot of technique involved here. And the people that do it well are very good at it. And and there are a lot of people that don't do it well. And, you know, so yeah. I, I, it, I found it from a brewing perspective. And for me, it being kind of a, um, you know, kind of a technical oriented brewer, I, I find them fascinating as, as a style. 
you know it's right. just really interesting to see how everything happens in those beers and 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 how different they are from what i was brewing at stone right i talked i talked to greg uh, kimmick up in uh an alchemist i did a podcast with him and he he said my beer you know it turned out hazy but i didn't really mean it to to be that way <laughs> Yeah, but but people look yeah. at his beer and they say, "Oh yeah, that's a hazy IPA, a New England IPA." He's like, "Nah, it's just my beer. I like I like you know I like the hops and I make the beer the way I want and it just comes out hazy." Yeah. But and his, his beer's great, you know. It's oh, yeah. been one of my favorites for a long time. Oh, the Heady Topper and he, the hops he got this year, he says are out of control. Actually, I had some. I just had some recently. Somebody brought me some, and it's really good. Like the the version that he had because it's like wine, I guess, with grapes, right? You know, one year yeah. you can have a great harvest, the next year it could be like, eh, you know, but, but it's the same thing with hops as well. Yeah, well, it really helps to go out and, and do selection in September with the, at the hop suppliers. And, oh. you know, if you're a big enough brewery and you can do you can do that and you get the invite to go do it, um, you, that way you get your pick. You know, you, yeah. you get to select from, you know, several different lots and Man. you can pick which one you think is going to work best in your beers. Oh, my and God. It's so worthwhile. But you do that, I guess they, you go, you would, you fly out. Well, you're out in California anyway. Do you go up to like Oregon or something or? Yeah, I have, I haven't actually done it in a couple of years. So um, I'm, I'm looking to get back into it next year. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But your, uh, your beer is excellent. I I have to try the, your uh, new realm. Where did the uh, new realm come from? The word. um... Oh, that's, that's funny. Um, you know, we, when I, when I joined Bob and Carrie, they already had gone through uh, piles of names, ideas, you know, and, and we decided pretty early on that we weren't going to try, we weren't going to try and use a name that somebody else had, had used either for a beer or for a brewery, you know, so we just said, you know, if the name's been used, it's off the list. And so we came up with, we had so many brainstorming sessions on the names and we came up with so many names and rejected so many names. And and New Realm was one that was just kind of hanging out there that somebody had suggested. And nobody, the funny thing is nobody remembers who actually first suggested the name. But, you know, we didn't find it. There was no problem with the name, um, but we didn't initially gravitate towards it. So it just kind of was on the perimeter of all the names and, and kind of out there. Um, and as we kept going through this and kept getting very frustrated with the fact that we couldn't agree on a name or find a name that hadn't already been used, um, that name came, came up again and again. And eventually we started talking about it in a little more in depth and realized that, you know, for us personally, you know, this, all of us came from long careers with other breweries. This was kind of a new realm for us. And, Mm. um, and we thought that might be kind of a cool thing to name our brewery, and so that's that's what we did. No, it's it's a it, it is a pretty cool name. I like your logo too. It's interesting. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, that is a Czech um, medieval god uh, or a Slavic uh, medieval god of hospitality. Oh man, and you got like a hop on his uh, head there too. I see. Yeah, we did. We made some artistic, uh, took some artistic liberties. <laughs> also, <laughs> hops on the side too. Yeah, yeah, yeah little hops on cool. the side, hops on the head, and the barley stalks for a beard. <laughs> oh, look at that! Yeah, that's cool. But that's uh, that's cool. All right. Well, well, Mitch, uh, I know you're you're a busy man. I don't want to keep you any longer. Anything you want to tell any like while you're leaving um, about local craft beer? Why sh- people should kind of you know support their local breweries and. Yeah, um, you know, I think first of all, you're you're never going to get fresher beer than you get at your local brewery, um, and fresh beer is the best. Um, you know, when you support local breweries, you're supporting families, you're supporting people that 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 don't make a heck of a lot of money, so your support goes a really long yeah. way. Um, you know, and, and these are people that are by and large are doing it for the love of what they're doing and they are passionate about it. And I always like to support people that have gotten into the business for those reasons, you know? And, um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really cool. It's really interesting to see how much local has taken off and, you know, how many breweries there are. And, you know, I saw a quote that everybody in this country lives within 10 miles of a brewery or something like that, you know, recently, which is amazing, you know, and, uh, certainly I see it here in Atlanta and I saw it at home in California when I was living there and, um, you know, that all the towns were getting a number of breweries and it just became, it's become quite the social Mm. thing to, to go pop into a few breweries on a, 
you know, an evening or a weekend afternoon or something. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's really kind of a neat phenomenon. And, um, you know, I just, I love it. I love the fact that, that these people are able to, you know, these smaller brewers are able to make a living for themselves by just selling beer out of their tap room. And mm-hmm. I, I think it's just amazing. It is cool. Uh, in Germany, every town has a brewery, so it's kind of yeah. turning to it. And before, pre-prohibition, there were many breweries in the U.S., you know, and the population was was much less. So per capita, I think we're trending yeah. back that way, you know. So people say there is a bubble, but I don't know. I don't know. It remains to be seen. It remains. To oh, be seen. I think there will be. I think I think you're seeing some markets are oversaturated. And- right. You know, they just uh, there just aren't enough people to support all of the right. breweries in some of these places. You're seeing a lot of brewery closings in Portland, Oregon, and in San Diego, and and some other spots. But mm. I think there's still a lot of room in other parts of the country. So I think the bubble uh, I would expect would be very regional or you know very mm-hmm. localized to certain areas. And you know, and I think the big brewers that are have gone national are the ones that are struggling because now all the local brewers are there and. You know, people and oh, yeah. you know don't need to buy a beer that's made two thousand miles away when no. they can get ten fresher versions of the same right. type of beer that, in their hometown. You know, that's exactly the trend. It's a hyper local trend. Yeah, it's the same yeah. thing. I mean, like Green Flash is unfortunate what happened to them, but people are like, look, yeah. I can get the IPA here. I have a brewery down the street, so. Uh, but they make exactly. excellent beer. So, yeah. All so right. it's a tough road for for those bigger brewers that are that are national. But you know, some of them are still doing very well, and I think they will. But you know, the ones that there are going to be ones that I think are going to suffer a bit. But yeah, you know, that's yeah. the nature of the business. I think you know it's very cyclical, and things go back and forth. Huh. And, yeah, I know the cans thing is killing me. I keep telling people, you know, putting it in. I can't really make any money putting these beer in cans. I don't know if you got. Do you guys do canning too down there? We do. We oh, you do. we bought a bottling line, and then we decided not to use it and just focus <laughs> on cans. Yes, so, um, but you saw nobody. Okay. Nobody in Atlanta is putting beer in bottles anymore. No, no, these crap beer stores are all cans. It's like yeah. You know, but I mean, I tried to build this business on twenty-two ounce bottles, and then they fell off the face of the earth. Boy, so, they sure did. Oh they man, sure did. I sell. I still wow. sell them here, and I'm trying to force. Uh, craft beer stores to take them again because we have beer that's good people want to buy it it's just the packaging but you know i don't know whatever yeah it's anyway, a tough one it's a tough one yes <laughs> so listen i i appreciate you being taking the time out to talk to me uh it's been great i appreciate what you do and i need to come down to uh atlanta actually i have a friend in atlanta i'm like go see mitch he's at new realm just go go there yeah. you'll, you'll, you'll have a great time you'll have a great beers so i know i know they'll be great so i have to get down there and try some but are you going to craft brewers conference no yeah, I will be Oh, there. you are. So maybe I'll bump into yeah. you there. I got a media pass. Hey, okay. a media. I have a podcast, right? They gave me a media pass. <laughs> nice. So nice. that's awesome. Okay. That's cool. Hey, so Fantastic. listen, I appreciate uh, you being on, and I, I want to let you go, but but take care. Talk soon. All right. You too. Thanks Thank you. a lot. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah, that was Mitch Steele. He was the former brewmaster at Stone Brewing. Who's doing? They did some fantastic stuff, and uh, now he's at New Realm Brewing uh, in Atlanta. Uh, and I'm looking on the website. I'm, I'm just the, the hops that he's using and the IPAs that he's doing, and even other other. Uh, uh, he says there's a Belgian session that's like the number one seller in in his Atlanta facility, and then they have a Munich Dunkel, which is. <laughs> You know, not not really a common beer, but that's the best seller in Virginia. Who would have known? You just got to make stuff and see what people like. You never know, you never know. But um, if and I appreciate Mitch being on. If you like our podcast, if you like what I'm doing, I'm trying to give you the best guys. Uh, you know, best brewmasters uh, that are out there. We got three. Oh man, the last three episodes are fantastic, man. Whoa, Whew. cool. But. You know, I I appreciate it if you could help me out. Go onto iTunes and uh, give us a rating, give us a review, tell a friend, tell ten friends. We're ten X here, and uh, you know, rating, review, subscribe. That just helps us get up the rankings. And we got to do this for iTunes. They have these algorithms, and they just notice when people are uh, giving good reviews out, and and they move you up in the rankings. And that helps us tremendously get attract more great guests, right? So please help me out with that. Um, if you got any questions or you have any comments, uh, I'm at Michael at craftbeerstorm.com. And, um, you know, if you have any brewers you want me to interview, I will. 
uh, you got any movers and shakers in the in the beer world uh, that you have connections with? Send them my way. Let's do it. Um, and just keep the keep keep the uh, party going, man. That's it. You just got to keep it going. But um, got Craft Brewers Conference coming up in uh, Denver as well. If you're out there or you're going to be out there, let me know. Send me an email. Let's connect. Enjoy some beer, some really great beer. It's going to be great. Okay, guys, um, that's all I have for today. We'll see you Wednesday for Beer Styles uh, episode. All right, take care.